Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone from Jerusalem, uh, Ramadan Karim. Uh, I'm here uh, speaking to you from the National Library of Israel, uh, from our campus uh, here on as part of the Hebrew University. Um, and we actually just uh, a few minutes ago finished celebrating uh, our first ever Ramadan Iftar uh, to celebrate the, the ending of the fast for the day. So it's a truly a pleasure for me to, uh, to be here with you and to talk to you about, uh, about uh, our topic for today, Alexander the Great from uh, Greek conqueror to Muslim prophet. Um, so Tadeusz, thank you for the introduction. Again, and uh, as, uh, as he said, I'm the curator of the Islam and Middle East collection here at the National Library of Israel. Uh, we have a collection of over half a million books, uh, as well as manuscripts, newspapers, archives, photographs, uh, and other materials relating to Islam, uh, the global religion, relating to uh, Palestinian history and society, uh, the Arab population of Israel, and uh, the global Middle East. Uh, so I'm going to be talking with you today about a particularly Iranian topic, uh, which is uh, truly where my heart lies, but uh, I'll also have the chance to show you images from some of the manuscripts from, from our collection. Uh, so to begin with, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, just bear with me one moment. Okay, I think we're ready. Um, uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm curator of the collection. And one of my great pleasures in this job is working with and learning from great scholars. Uh, we have the privilege uh, here in, in Jerusalem of having a wonderful university uh, and uh, as well as a number of other first class universities throughout the country and, uh, and great professors, researchers working in the field of Islam. Uh, and, uh, my role as curator uh, and our role here at the National Library, one of our roles is providing these scholars with what they need to do their research, books and materials, uh, access to archives, access to our manuscripts, finding uh, materials in other institutions around the world, doing projects together. Uh, and this is especially uh, satisfying for me because uh, I can, help make research happen without having the extra burden of actually producing it. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I want to say that every everything that I'll be discussing in my talk today, really I learned from one of my own great teachers, uh, Professor Yulia Rubinovich of the Hebrew University here. Uh, Professor Rubinovich is an expert in Persian literature and Iranian medieval poetry in particular. And she studied extensively exactly the question that will occupy us tonight, how the figure of Alexander the Great changed over time. Uh, in particular, the, the reinvention of his character at the hands of the greatest poets of the Persian literary tradition, Ferdowsi in his Book of Kings, Nizami in his Quintet, uh, which also known as the Hamsa, uh, and others. I, I see there was a comment about the poor audio. Uh, I hope you can hear me more clearly now. Um, uh, please let me know uh, if it's still a problem. Uh, we hear you well. Okay, great. Thanks, Tadeusz. Uh, so in her work, Professor Rubinovich focuses um, in particular on the interaction between orality and writing, right? How, how stories and certain elements, certain motifs from those stories move back and forth between these two realms, the realm of the spoken, right? Uh, we all exist in oral court cultures. We share ideas, we talk to each other, we pass stories and rumors back and forth. Um, but we also uh, exist in, of course, in a written world. Uh, we read texts all day. Uh, sometimes it seems like we spend all day reading texts and not doing anything else. Um, and uh, in our day, these two realms interact with each other, the oral and the written. And the same is true of, uh, of antiquity uh, from Alexander the Great's day to our own. So, right, oral literature consists of stories, laws, traditions, proverbs, and ideas that have been told and retold over the generations. 
And for most of human history, orality was much more prevalent and influential than written texts. The, the canonical written cult works of almost every culture on earth look back to earlier oral versions. This is true of the Bible and the New Testament and also the Quran. Uh, in fact, in the case of the Quran, it's a particularly interesting example of this transition from orality to writing and the interaction between these two modes of preservation and memory. Uh, the Quran, of course, was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel over the course of 23 years, beginning in the early 7th century CE. The Prophet uh, relayed the verses that he had heard uh, and had been commanded to repeat by the angel uh, to his followers in his sermons and his speeches, uh, and also to uh, a series of scribes, right, professional scribes who copied down his words. Um, it seems, uh, and scholars believe, that most, if not all, of the Quran existed in written form somehow, uh, already in the Prophet's lifetime, but it hadn't yet been uh, compiled and coalesced into a single authoritative book. Uh, so because of that, it was only after the Prophet's death in 632 CE that the Islamic community sought to codify and verify the contents of the revelation. Interestingly, uh, the impetus for these efforts was a fear that those among the Prophet's original companions who had memorized the Quran in its entirety might be killed. Uh, they might die in battle uh, because those were precisely the years when Islam was expanding first in the Arabian Peninsula and then throughout the Middle East world. And it was feared that with them, uh, their memory, their authoritative oral traditions, their memory of what the text of the Quran really said would be lost as well. Uh, so according to the tradition, uh, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, ordered that all the existing fragments of the Quran, uh, written and oral, be gathered together, that they be checked, and that they each, each verse be verified by two witnesses to ensure that it was really accurate and had really been revealed to Muhammad. Uh, and only then would those verses be considered as part of the sacred text. So the, the story of Alexander the Great uh, intersects with this discussion of orality and writing. Um, uh, right? Why am I mentioning this at all at the beginning of a talk about Alexander? Um, and it intersects in particular with the account of the Quran's compilation. Uh, as we'll see, Alexander himself was actually mentioned in the Quran. And it also follows the sacred text model of exchange and cross-fertilization. As uh, we will discuss in what follows, Alexander's character changes as he moves from text to text within, uh, within the Islamic tradition, uh, and also over time. And uh, as we move forward, I, I would ask that you keep orality in mind. Every text that we discuss also draws on an unseen uh, and unrecorded really oral tradition uh, that exists in parallel alongside it uh, and, uh, and gives it its life, if you will. Um, uh, it's invisibility, the invisibility of orality does not reduce its importance. So what do we see here? Um, what we're looking at is uh, an image taken from a medieval Persian manuscript. Uh, and we see here uh, two main figures, uh, one kneeling uh, and the second uh, lying down, resting his head on, on the first knees. Two figures uh, who occupy the center of, of our attention. Now, this looks just on the most surface level, this looks like uh, an image perhaps from India, and it is in, in fact uh, from a manuscript copied uh, in South Asia in the 17th century. Um, and it doesn't look Greek, right? I mean, if, if we could say anything about what we're seeing and sort of the collective or, or uh, our own cultural uh, fluency in what constitutes Greek and Hellenistic culture, it doesn't look like this. Nevertheless, what we're seeing is a, is a painting of Alexander. Um, and I wanted to start with this image, which is from one of the manuscripts in our collection and one of my favorites actually, uh, just to, to begin to talk about the gulf, right? The gap between the historical Alexander and the Alexander who exists 
within the Islamic tradition, uh, within legends, within uh, and uh, and within uh, within later elaborations of his stories within Islam. Um, so the figure who's kneeling with the halo around his head uh, is Alexander the Great himself. Uh, you can see his retainers behind him uh, holding over his head a fan to shield him from the sun, another particularly Indian element, uh, as well as his horse. And the figure lying down is the king of the Persian Empire, Darius III. Um, Darius is, is dying, actually. Uh, he's his life breath is fleeing his body at the very moments that we're looking at this painting. Um, and this is an image of comfort. I mean, the, the caption, as it were, for, for this painting, which reappears numerous times within uh, the Persian miniature tradition, is Alexander comforts the dying Darius. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's trying to both assuage his passage from one world to the next, uh, and also to, in so doing, to gain legitimacy. Uh, because Alexander, at this moment, becomes not just a Greek conqueror, not just a hero, uh, but in fact takes the place of Darius as the emperor of Achaemenid Persia. So, from uh, I, I really want to start, as it were, with the historical facts, uh, such as we know them about Alexander the Great and his own life and his truly incredible achievement, right? He was born in 356 BCE in the kingdom of Macedon uh, in the northern part of the Greek peninsula, trained as a youth by no less illustrious a figure than the philosopher Aristotle. Alexander assume, assumed the throne of Macedon at the age of 20, following his father Philip's death in 336 uh, BCE. Within only a few years of that event, Alexander had uh, conquered and taken control of all of Greece and was poised to, poised to launch an attack on the Greeks' famed enemy, the Persian Empire. So what, what you can see here on the screen is actually a map uh, from a much, much later date. Uh, it's a later European map, um, part of our rich and uh, truly fascinating map collection here at the library. And it's a map which gives us uh, a sense of Alexander's conquests uh, on the very uh, far side of the screen, on the European side, if you will. Uh, if you look closely, you can see Macedon uh, right above the Greek peninsula uh, or at the top and stretching all, or I'm sorry, on the Western side, you see Macedon and stretching all the way East to the very borders of India is the Persian empire. Um, the as as many of you I'm sure know for the more than a century preceding Alexander's birth the Greeks and the Persians had fought a number of wars uh, these wars are immortalized in some of the you know what we know as the classics the classics of Greek literature Herodotus uh, Plato Aristotle as well refers to them uh, the Athenian dramatists and poets they're the stuff themselves of legend um, and there was a historical and, uh, uh, and very important rivalry, cultural as well as military, between the Greek city-states and the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Um, however, uh, that enmity, uh, that contest, was about to be changed radically. In 334 BCE, Alexander invaded Persia, uh, which, as I said, stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to uh, what's now Afghanistan and Central Asia, really the borders with India and China. After only three battles, by 330, Alexander's forces had defeated the Persians, leaving the young commander ruler of the largest empire on earth. The last Persian king, Darius III, uh, whom I already mentioned, fled the capital of Persepolis, which Alexander subsequently burned to the ground, only to be assassinated by uh, one, of his, uh, one of his governors of the regions. This act of destruction, which is to say Alexander's destruction of Persepolis, symbolized the end of the, end of the campaign of retribution against the Persians. 
and payback for the destruction caused in Greece by Achaemenid arm armies in earlier wars. Alexander then took on the trappings, the, the symbols of Persian kingship, including the various court ceremonies, uh, adopted the idea that he himself had been divinely elected to rule, that he himself was no less than a god, uh, and uh, elevated himself to be the single uh, autarch, the single ruler of all of Asia. Alexander next turned his attention to India, launching a campaign on territories across the Indus River, uh, but his army refused to cooperate. They revolted and he was forced to turn back, returning to the city of Babylon in today's Iraq that he had declared would be his capital. However, uh, only a few years later, or very soon after that, in 323 uh, BCE, Alexander died, perhaps having been assassinated at the age of 33. Uh, so the importance of Aristotle, and uh, we'll talk about this more in what follows, um, in the Persian tradition, uh, or the importance of Aristotle as a figure in, uh, in Alexander's story, uh, both historically and in its later iterations, uh, can we can sort of take that from, from this image that you're seeing here, superimposed on the map. Uh, this is taken from the same 17th century Indian uh, copy of Nizami's Book of Alexander, uh, the same source for the image I showed you before of the uh, Alexander comforting the dying Darius. Uh, and in the painting you see here, it's actually fascinating. Uh, the figure in the center with the halo is Alexander himself. And the figure sitting opposite him, facing him is in white, one might think to be Alexander, but is in fact Alexander, uh, one might think to be Aristotle, but is in fact uh, Aristotle's father, Nicodemus. Uh, Aristotle himself is sitting just uh, behind Alexander. Uh, so the painter here clearly uh, wanted to portray the idea that uh, not only that Alexander gained his knowledge uh, from the source from whom Aristotle himself learned, that is his father, but was a, but the positioning of Alexander and Aristotle showed that the Alexander was himself uh, perhaps a more advanced student um, who gained the better attention of the teacher and whom is looking at the, the book that's open before them together. Uh, and here I just want to show you uh, a few images of Persepolis, uh, also part of our collection here at the National Library. Uh, Persepolis, located near the city of Shiraz in today's Iran, was of course the capital of the Achaemenid Persian Empire which Alexander burned to the ground as part of his conquest, but the ruins survive today and are extremely important in the modern history of Iran. Uh, and these photos were actually taken by an Israeli uh, photographer, Benno Rothenberg, who visited, who photographed uh, extensively here locally uh, in the land of Israel, but also traveled to Iran in 1968 uh, to take these pictures that are now part of our collection. So, there's a, there's a lot more that we could say about Alexander's life and conquests and about the revolutionary culture encounter that took place in their wake. Hellenism, right, is in the sense of the, the melding or the meeting of Greek culture with various local cultures, changed the scope of human civilization. All the lands that Alexander con conquered from, uh, from Egypt uh, to India were influenced and uh, adopted parts, uh, selected parts of Greek culture, including here in Jerusalem. Uh, so this wasn't just, to name one example, uh, through the translation of the Bible into Greek, right? The famous Septuagint translation of the Bible or uh, the making of sculpture in the Greek style in Bactria, uh, a region located today in Afghanistan. Uh, but also uh, Hellenism, uh, which is a word that that um, uh, a term that's that's cast in some doubt today. Uh, but I think uh, if we take it uh, in its most general sense and most broad sense, I think really describes the the process that we're talking about. Hellenism continued for centuries uh, after Alexander's death, 
in the lands that became his short-lived empire, um, including within the Islamic sphere, right? The hundred years, hundreds of years later, uh, there was a revolution, truly a revolution of science, of philosophy, medicine, and theology that resulted from the translation of the Greek intellectual tradition into Arabic. Uh, at the instigation of the Abbasid Caliphs, uh, beginning in the 8th century CE, almost all of Greek literature was not just translated into Arabic, um, but also comment upon, commented upon, expanded, argued with, and revised within the Islamic sphere and within the Arabic language, the Greek philosophical and literary tradition continued under a new guise, not just continued, but, but was advanced. Um, and uh, I want to give you, I mean, there are lots of examples that we could show and talk about. Um, uh, so I'm Sorry that the slides apparently are out of focus. Uh, I, let me see what I can do about that. Um, I'm not sure I can do anything at the moment. Uh, so uh, with your, uh, so my apologies and I hope that you bear with me. Um, and uh, I'll try and see if I can fix it a little further on. Um, so I can do it this way. Okay. Sorry, give me just one, bear with me for one second. And I'm glad I was reading the chat uh, as we were going on. Um, So here we go. Okay. I'm sure everyone is here we are. Everyone is uh used to the pitfalls of Zoom. Um, yeah, much better. Thank you, Sam. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Tadeus, and thank you everyone. Uh Zoom, I, I suppose we're we've come to the end of the corona. Uh I hope at least. Um so uh, we've all become experts in in uh, how to manage presentations of this kind. So, so what I'm showing you now uh, is an image of uh, from one of the manuscripts again in our collection here at the National Library, uh, a manuscript written by Kamal al Din al Farisi, one of the greatest exer experts in the field of optics that the world has ever known. Uh, so the image you're seeing here uh, is one of the diagrams from this manuscript. Uh, and it shows how light enters a lens uh, and is refracted through it. Uh, and just because of, uh, there's lots of other pages from this manuscript that I would want to share, uh, but this is actually my favorite. Um, so uh, Alfarisi's work was a revision of an earlier book of optics, as you see from the caption, uh, by Ibn al-Haytham, uh, uh, again, a, a extremely important uh, and uh, groundbreaking scientist uh, in the field of optics uh, and ophthalmology, the study of the eye, which was actually one of the areas in which, uh, in which Islamic, in which Muslim uh, physicians uh, really departed from the Greek tradition of uh, Galen and Hippocrates. Um, and this, this one manuscript, this one gem, I think really shows how, uh, how the ideas of Greek civilization and Greek culture were taken up within Islam, expanded on and continued. The manuscript we're seeing here is from the 16th century uh, and it demonstrates the continuity of this tradition. Uh, the revolutionary translation movement took place in the ninth century, and this is a manuscript from almost seven centuries later. Uh, these ideas and uh, this knowledge was continually copied, passed on, commented on, and, uh, and invested in 
uh, even in later periods. So we can go back to, uh, to Alexander uh, and to the Alexander story. Um, so not only was uh, Greek science and Greek medicine uh, uh, given entree and, uh, and valued within Islam, but Alexander's own legend uh, was also an integral part of the Hellenistic tradition that he inaugurated. Stories about his fabulous and nearly unbelievable exploits began to circulate within his own lifetime. Uh, and these various sources were first set down in writing already in the third century C BCE. It was then in Alexandria, right? The city in Egypt uh, that Alexander himself founded and to which he gave his own name uh, that an unknown author compiled numerous accounts uh, about Alexander's life and his exploits into a text that we know as the Greek Alexander Romance. Uh, this is uh, a fictionalized biography of Alexander's life and his reign. And the text includes, among other elements, uh, the story of Alexander's quote unquote true parentage. Uh, that is to say that he's not really or wasn't really the son of Philip of Macedon, uh, but actually the son of the pharaoh uh, Nectanebo, uh, given the Egyptian context for the text, that makes sense. Um, supposed letters exchanged between Alexander and the Persian king Darius, and another fictitious letter from Alexander to Aristotle, describing the strange creatures and wondrous lands that he encountered on his trip to India. Now, the original version of this text um, in Greek was translated and copied in a host of languages, uh, Hebrew, Armenian, Latin, Italian, and many others. And the widespread diffusion of the Alexander romance can explain the fact that, uh, that stories about Alexander and anecdotes about him appear in all kinds of sources, right? There's even mentions of Alexander the Great in the Babylonian Talmud, and ultimately they go back to this source. Um, of particular importance for us is, are actually translations of the Alexander romance into a language called Syriac, which is a dialect of Aramaic uh, spoken in the East uh, and used particularly among Christians. Um, and versions of this uh, Syriac translation of the Alexander romance were completed sometime in the seventh century CE. Um, likely as part of the uh, Basid Arabic translation movement that I mentioned just a few moments ago. These Syriac versions were then further translated into Arabic and became part of the mix of material that served uh, the Islamic Alexander tradition. So alongside, uh, so alongside the Alexander romance, uh, there are actually uh, two other main branches, one could say. Um, that lead into the development of Alexander among the Persian poets. Um, Alexander is mentioned in the Quran himself, uh, and uh, which is an interesting fact, uh, and one that might surprise some, but is actually uh, something that shouldn't shock us. Uh, Arabia, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, was not separated or uh, uh, was actually part of larger cultural trends. Mecca, the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad, was already a pilgrimage and trade center during his lifetime. And Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, and adherents to other faiths came and visited and lived in the city. So chapter 18 of the Quran, Surat al-Kaf, the chapter of the cave is the title, includes in it a brief account of the adventures of the two-horned one, as he's called, um, who traveled to the far east as well as the far west. Uh, verses 83 to 97 of this chapter describe how this two-horned one found strange peoples in distant lands, idolaters, barbarians, and even the terrible Gog and Magog. The two-horned one constructed a barrier of iron and copper to keep Gog and Magog from attacking. <coughs> 
My apologies. <coughs> Sorry. Just give me one second. Apologies about that. I'm okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as I was saying, the two horned one <clears throat> mentioned in the Quran. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> I think I'm right. So this two-horned one mentioned in the Quran constructed a wall made of iron and copper to keep Gog and Magog from attacking. <clears throat> and this wall that he made will continue to exist until the apocalypse at the end of days. Now, <clears throat> I feel like I'm going through the end of days myself right now, but I'm actually okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll just go back one second. The image that, that you can see here, uh, the, which is taken from a, an 18th century manuscript, which compiles popular traditions about Alexander the Great. Uh, the figure on the with the two horns is the two horned one, uh, Alexander himself. <coughs> and uh, this page here is taken from, or shows actually the section of the Quran, the verses that mention this interesting and, uh, and surprising figure. So within the interpretive tradition, the the two horned one is identified explicitly with Alexander the Great, and there's a number of explanations <clears throat> and a number of theories about why he gets this name. Uh, either it refers to actual horns that he had physically, uh, or alternatively, it refers to the metaphorical horns. Uh, the Alexander's rule in the sense over both Greece on the one side and Persia on the other, or to his travels that encircled the world like two curving horns. Um, in any case, what's fascinating about the Quran's version is, is that it focuses not on Alexander's battles or about his conquests uh, of the Persian Empire or anywhere else, sort of what's part of our own historical memory of Alexander, but it focuses on his discovery <clears throat> and his investigation of remote regions, the strange, the bizarre, and the new, and coupled with divine inspiration. In the Quran's account, Alexander actually speaks or is spoken to by God. He seems in some way uh, to have the status <clears throat> even of a prophet, a pre-Islamic prophet. Now, there was also a third avenue or third way, a third means by which traditions about Alexander made their way into the Islamic world. Uh, this was through um, the Iranian remembrance or the Iranian memory of Alexander the Great, not as a hero, but as a destroyer. Right, so we, we mentioned before that when Alexander conquered Persia, he burned the Iranian capital, capital of Persepolis, uh, the Achaemenid capital of Persepolis, and ended Persian sovereignty for centuries to come. Zoroastrianism, uh, the ancient Iranian religion, uh, <clears throat> related in many ways to uh, the religion of India, Hinduism. Uh, so... Uh, 
Zoroastrian texts refer to Alexander as the accursed one, one of the creatures created by the evil spirit who have come to attack Iran over the millennia. Uh, Zoroastrian texts in Middle Persian, um, most of which were written down between the 6th and the 9th centuries CE, describe how Alexander not only destroyed Persepolis, but also burned the sacred scripture known as the Avesta. Uh, Alexander's intervention, as it were, in Iranian history is seen as one that, that brought Zoroastrianism, at least from the perspective of later authors, almost to its very end. Uh, the scholars and sages who followed, and as well as the kings, were tasked with bringing together these the surviving fragments of the Avesta. And there's actually a beautiful passage uh, in one of the later Zoroastrian texts about the, the effort to seek out sections of the Avesta, of the sacred scripture, even when they exist in the texts of other religions, uh, a very ecumenical idea. So how then does Alexander the Great appear in the works of the major Persian poets? And here I'm returning to the, the painting, the miniature painting from Nizami that we examined before. <clears throat> I want to focus in what follows on, on actually two poets, uh, both of whom are giants of the Persian literary tradition. So the first is Abul Qasim Ferdowsi, the 11th century author of the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Ferdowsi's epic uh, really retells the story of Iranian civilization from the creation of the world to the Islamic conquest of Iran in the mid 7th century. While he himself uh, was an orthodox believing Muslim, <clears throat> in his work, Ferdowsi extols Iran's pre-Islamic past and celebrates its kings and heroes. And his work uh, not only was celebrated in its own day, but continues until now to be one of the cornerstones of Persian literature uh, and uh, and Ferdowsi had numerous imitators, uh, numerous uh, fans, numerous copyists, uh, numerous illustrators and artists who, who uh, gave, his, gave the manuscripts of his work life over the centuries. Um, and if you ask Iranians from Tehran to Tel Aviv to Los Angeles, uh, many of them uh, can still recite the most famous of Ferdowsi's rhyming couplets by heart. So Ferdowsi actually includes Alexander in his catalog of Persian rulers, uh, a significant adaptation that's related to the image we're seeing right now. Um, this is part of a larger, what we might call iranization uh, of Alexander's character and earlier versions of the story. So in the poet's retelling, Alexander is not actually the son of Philip of Macedon, as we know he was historically, but was instead seen or is cast as the offspring of the Iranian king and the legitimate heir to the Persian throne. Um, oops, sorry. This lends particular pathos and emotion to the episode of Alexander comforting the dying Darius. Right, having dismounted his horse, Alexander calls for the best doctors to treat the fatally wounded king and promises to restore him to the throne. And it's Darius, in this reading of Ferdowsi's retelling, is not just the king of Persia, but is in fact Alexander's brother, or half-brother at the very least. And after Darius breathes his last, Alexander hangs his, uh, the Persian king's assassins and buries Darius himself in a tomb that's just fit for a king. Another central part of the Shahnameh retelling of Alexander's story uh, is the Greek conqueror's travels in the land of darkness in search of the waters of immortal life. So here he's led on, on his journey by Khidr, uh, another prophet who appears, uh, is again mentioned in the Quran and whose role is elaborated in later traditions. Um, so as uh, Alexander and Khidr walk through this uh, uh, bizarre, strange realm of darkness, uh, Alexander loses his way and uh, encounters the angel Israfel, right, who's, who's depicted as holding a trumpet 
uh, ready for God's order to sound, uh, blast the horn, to resurrect the dead and to bring about the end of days. I mean, it's really an apocalyptic scene. In this meeting, Israel, Israfil chastises Alexander to abandon his vain worldly adventures and uh, his journeys just for the sake of pleasure and curiosity. In this episode and elsewhere, Ferdowsi portrays Alexander really interestingly, I think, as a powerful figure, a legendary figure, but one who lacks clear purpose and direction. Ferdowsi's Alexander is driven by curiosity and little more. And the poet emphasizes the Greek hero's faults and his imperfections. And it, it might be the case uh, that this portrayal of uh, and Ferdowsi's perspective here retains some me measure of the criticism that we find in earlier Zoroastrian accounts that condemn Alexander as the ravager of Iran and the destroyer of the Avesta. <clears throat> so in, uh, in contrast to Ferdowsi, uh, we can turn to the 12th century poet Nizami of Ganje, uh, equally famous and equally influential. Um, and Nizami uh, takes an, a different direction. Though many of the plot points uh, from the Shahnameh retelling of Alexander's story remain, Nizami fills them with a moral meaning. As in the rest of the five romantic epics that make up his quintet, his Hamsa, Nizami's Alexander becomes a model for emulation. His conquests and his journeys are driven by the desire for justice rather than by mere curiosity. So I want to point out just a couple of the um, significant differences between the Shahnameh account that we described a few minutes ago and uh, Nizami's account. So first of all, um, Nizami dismisses the, the myth, uh, the idea uh, that Alexander is descended from Iranian kings. Uh, instead, he embraces the historically true genealogy that Alexander is the son of Philip of Macedon. And secondly, uh, in an interesting counter again to Ferdowsi's ironization of the Greek conqueror, Nizami includes a unique episode. Following Alexander's conquest of the Persian Empire, he portrays Alexander as destroying the Zoroastrian houses of worship, the fire temples. Uh, and from the, the image you see here, uh, again from a manuscript from our own National Library collection uh, copied in Kashmir, this is one of uh, the rare examples of a painting of this particular episode. Uh, the building on flames in the back is actually a Zoroastrian temple, and that figure inside may be a priest. Uh, and Alexander himself seems to be uh, the figure riding on the elephant in the foreground. Um, now, uh, this uh, this extension of the story, this particular extension of the story, um, may relate to uh, uh, the traditions about Alexander's destruction of the Avesta that we found in Zoroastrian texts. Um, but to me, it seems particularly aimed to divorce Alexander from the pre-Islamic Iranian tradition, meaning to make of him much more of a, a Muslim or sort of pre-Islamic prophet in the Muslim tradition, much more uh, universal and, uh, and global rather than particularly Iranian. And this leads me actually to the, the last point I wanted to mention uh, before we open up uh, uh, the forum for questions. Um, and that is that Nizami's Alexander is really a philosopher. Uh, not only uh, is he trained by the great Aristotle, uh, but within his account of, uh, of Alexander's adventures, uh, his conquests, uh, his loves, also a uh, theme that we really didn't get to talk about, um, and uh, his, uh, his journeys, uh, Nizami also includes numerous stories about other pre-Islamic, other Greek uh, philosophers. Uh, Socrates, Plato, Hermes, uh, and others, uh, their tales are woven into Nizami's telling of the Alexander legend. Um, and here I think we return to the 
point I made before about the integration and the entry of Greek thought, Greek tradition, Greek wisdom into the realm of Islam uh, and how the story of Alexander the Great comes together with the best of uh, classical thought and classical philosophy in the hands of Nizami, uh, the great Persian poet. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me uh, while I uh, almost passed into uh, the realm of the beyond myself for a few minutes. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions uh, in the time that remains. Uh, thank you, Sam, for this fascinating uh, lecture, and we are all happy um, you're alive, still with us. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody more than me. Yeah, actually, yeah, we do have a few questions which just pop out now, so um, I will uh, read them loudly. Uh, so Iftikhar Malik, uh, actually, he's, she's, I'm, I think he is writing. Um, I have a couple of questions regarding, regarding Cyrus the Great, uh, and the British colonial reconstruction of Alexander's myth. Um, well, he didn't specify more, uh, but maybe you can say already something about that. Uh, no, I'd, I'd like to, I'd love to. Um, uh, so uh, I'm also seeing requests to, to share the screen again. I'd be happy to do that. And maybe we'll have uh, that really cool map in the background while we talk about questions here we go okay um so uh the cyrus the myth of cyrus and british colonialism uh and we can talk in particular so let's start here cyrus the great uh known uh in the hebrew tradition tradition as koresh right he appears in the bible um as a perhaps the model for the redeemer of israel but that's a different story um so Cyrus's tomb is located in Persepolis. He was uh, not the founding king, but the first most important king who really established the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Um, and uh, Cyrus is connected to modernity in two ways, I would say. Uh, and by modernity, I, I mean the colonial project um, and in particular uh, the remaking of Iranian modernism and the modern idea of the Iranian nation. Um, and I hope this speaks to the question uh, in the end. Uh, so first of all, there's the Cyrus Cylinder, right? Which is uh, a text in cuneiform uh, written on a clay cylinder, uh, which was uh, discovered, if I'm not mistaken, in Babylonia. Uh, and the Cyrus Cylinder is important because it's uh, the, the text, it, the text that it, uh, that it relays. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry. I pressed the wrong thing here. Um, um, so the text that it, that it uh, contains discusses uh, or sort of grants the right for uh, peoples now under the now under Persian rule to practice their own religions. It's it was lauded after its discovery and particularly by um, uh, the Shah Muhammad Riza Pahlavi, the, uh, who ruled Iran from the Second World War uh, really up to uh, the Islamic Revolution in 1979. It was lauded as, uh, as the first human rights declaration, the first um, uh, in, uh, ensconcing or codification of, of human rights and tolerance in human history. Um, so the, the object, the physical object itself is important um, uh, because there's a deep connection between Western archeology span and colonialism and Orientalism and uh, where the Cyrus cylinder sits. And perhaps the person who asked the question could elaborate on this himself uh, is important to its history. Um, but uh, but also because the adoption of Cyrus as a model uh, for uh, for Iranian leaders and Iranian political thinkers in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, late 19th and 20th centuries, uh, is important because it 
part of what they were trying to do was try and skip over the Islamic history of Iran to reconnect pre-Islamic Iranian tradition, particularly the strong, powerful, and important empire of Cyrus to the new nation of Iran uh, that they were building and modernizing at that time. Um, so I said a lot of things. I hope that answers the question, but maybe we'll move on to the next one. Uh, in that case. Yeah, actually, but um, I unmuted Iftikhar, so maybe uh, ah, Iftikhar, you, you can say uh, if um, Sam's answer is satisfying or you would like to ask more yeah. questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sam, uh, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think your first point uh, that uh, he came back from Punjab, from uh, India, Pakistan today, because his soldiers uh, felt homesick. Actually, most of the historians believe that he came back because that was the ultimate end of the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's another interpretation. Uh, number two, um, when I mentioned Cyrus the, you know, uh, the Great, because as you showed in the Quran, it's uh, Sikandar's name is not mentioned, but it's called Zulkarnan, you know, with two horns. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you elaborated, maybe some people think that it was not Alexander the Macedonian, it was Cyrus because he gave uh, the first charter of human rights. Mm -hmm. and he allowed the Jews to reconstruct the temple. And so because of his tolerance and, you know, that maybe that's the kind of spiritual, you know, view of Cyrus. But, but I think uh, my feeling is that when the British started writing history of India, they were more interested in classical period. And uh, so, so they built up uh, the interest in, uh, Alexander, because East India Company wanted to show that they were the new Greeks uh, mm -hmm. to give India back to Indians, which means uh, the Hindu majority. And so, so the Muslim period became a period of the outsiders and the invaders. And that is where uh, the myth of Alexander was created that, um, you know, we have come back to build up India. And uh, this is where in early 19th century, I mean, I can give you lots of names of uh, historians um, uh, who sort of got interested into this archeology span and they even said that Kandahar mm -hmm. was basically uh, Alexandria because there were about 17 Alexandrias that Alexander had uh, founded or changed their names. And near Kabul in Bagram, there were coins which were uh, excavated uh, in 1830s by a British uh, self-educated archeologist who was actually an absconder uh, from the East India uh, Company forces. And he is considered to be the first person to suggest that this was actually the city which was established by Alexander and these coins belong to Alexander. So since then, so, so I think there was an ambiguity in the Muslim sort of literary tradition, and this was a great Persianate. So you're very right that uh, Firdosi and Nizami Ganjvi created this myth, and this got juxtaposed uh, during this Persianate period. And then it was sort of built up by this reconstruction of East India Company's historiography of um, ancient India. So, I mean, Iskandar still need, seems to be a very popular name in the Muslim world, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Iran, and in the Arab world. But um, lots of people are sort of double-minded. The educated people are double-minded when they look at Alexander the Macedonian. And um, so, so there is a confusion, and that is why I referred to uh, Cyrus because I thought Cyrus could be a possibility of being Zulkarnan, who is mentioned in the Quran here as you're showing. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, you know, you're talking about it. And uh, in Pakistan, I have noticed that there are lots of people who are saying, why do we appropriate the name of Alexander who was an invader? Why mm -hmm. not talk about Porus, the Raja who fought against Alexander 
And uh, this fam famous battle, I was actually born just 20 miles from that place. Mm -hmm. So this battle was fought by this famous river, Jhelum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so Porus is becoming very popular. And you could say that this is a kind of nationalist reconstruction of this history. But Herodotus is the first person who talked about monsters and who talked about Agog and Magog and all those kind of things. And then perhaps this is how they found their way uh, into Quran. But um, I wish you could give uh, another presentation which you just focus on, uh, on Alexander's recreation or reconstruction of Alexander, not only by Muslims, I mean, by early Islam, Quran, but also by the, and then by, then in India, how it became so popular. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I spoke so much. No, but, no, but, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And um, yes, it's a wonderful subject, worth probing. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, I also wish I could give, <laughs> I could give another talk about, about some of the topics you mentioned, uh, in particular, the reconstruction of Alexander across cultures and in, in particular, in our days, right? I mean, the, what I think, what, what I feel very connected to in what you said is the idea that Alexander is an extremely productive figure meaning he's one of uh, he's one of the historical figures who during his life already becomes legend and who gets continually reactivated right and recast reformulated reproduced reunderstood uh, throughout history um, from uh, the East India Company uh, or you know to Nizami to uh, the the Greek Alexander romance I also really agree and uh, and want to second the idea that ancient history, with, by which I mean everything before the modern era, is really modern history. Because everything that we understand about the deep past is based on, is based on the work uh, done by people who live only a few decades before us, right? I mean, the fact that, uh, that archaeologists in 19th century um, Afghanistan discovered coins that they ascribed to Alexander and who identified Kandahar as Alexandria speaks, as you, as you exactly rightly said, to their own prejudices, their own perspectives, and their own understanding of, of history. Um, if, if I can just, I mean, I definitely want to get at least one more question, but if I could just make a further point, the manuscript sort of in precisely that vein. The manuscript you're seeing here, part of the National Library of Israel collection today, uh, was donated by a uh, uh, Jerusalem-born Jewish Arabic-speaking uh, scholar, manuscript collector, and, um, and uh, man of the world, you, you might say, Avram Shalom Yehuda, uh, who over the course of three decades or more amassed uh, what was the largest and most important manuscript collection or collection of Islamic manuscripts in the 20th century. Uh, he sold manuscripts to Princeton, to uh, uh, Cambridge University, uh, to the University of Michigan and other great institutions. Uh, at the end of his life, he donated his remaining manuscripts here to, to the National Library. And we have uh, just about 2,500 manuscripts uh, today, uh, over half of which come from Yehuda. So the point I want to make is just that our access to these texts uh, comes through people like Yehuda, who gathered manuscripts, who selected them, and his own criteria, his own perspective on the world, his own idea that he had to collect this copy of the Quran, let's say, uh, and not another copy of the Quran really determines what we know and how we can know it. Um, uh, and yeah, so I, I really appreciate your comment and your point. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Iftikhar. Uh, okay, let's move on to another question. Um, Anka Dan uh, is asking, uh, in the Nizami picture, how to explain the snake in the front of elephant? How to, are we talking about this picture or are we talking perhaps about? 
this one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, that is a great, a great question, and I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I can say as a as someone who knows a little bit about Zoroastrianism, the snake here doesn't speak to me uh, of being a particularly Zoroastrian symbol, but the fire temple also doesn't really look like uh, Zoroastrian religious institutions or, or places of worship in India. Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. Okay, we'll, we'll keep it for later. Uh, okay, another one. Uh, Philip Fernandez is asking, uh, any conjecture why the assimilation of Greek writings into Arabic scholarly tradition did not develop Islamic thought that occurred with early Christian thinkers? Um, I, if the, if the question means why didn't uh, Arab, Muslim philosophers and thinkers engage with Greek writings by origin, let's say, or other uh, early Christian uh, religious thinkers. Um, uh, sometimes they did, is the answer, right? Many of the early translators were themselves Christian um, uh, and often translated, uh, and by early translators, I mean translators from Greek into Arabic, um, beginning in the 8th and ninth centuries. So many of them were Christians and translated from Syriac uh, to Arabic as well as from Greek to Arabic. Uh, and that bridge, as it were, the bridge of Syriac between the Greek originals and the Arabic translations was really integral and essential in the early period. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, OK. You could... Another one? Are you still able to take another question? Yeah, let's let's do let's do one more. Okay, uh, actually, something which brings us to Judaism more. Barbara Berry is asking, uh, is writing, Moses, which also has two horns. It was a misunderstanding of the beams of light in Torah that emanated from Moses' head. Is this coincidence or something more? Do you think? Um, I think I think it's something that I've been thinking about myself uh, as I as I prepared uh, the talk today. I think it is actually just coincidence, meaning that the the misreading of the verse uh, describing how light emanated right. That's what we're talking about. Light emanated from uh, from Moses uh, uh, after he returned from uh, Mount Sinai with the tablets, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that it's just a coincidence that there's that figure which was wrongly translated uh, and the two horned one figure of, of, uh, of Alexander. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a question that deserves further research, uh, but I think if we can if we can sum up and maybe have a takeaway uh, for our entire time together tonight, it's how how much the figure of Alexander crosses all of these cultures, right? He crosses and and mm -hmm. geographies uh, from India to the land of Israel to Jerusalem, where we are today, between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Uh, and he's a figure who connects. Um, so on this night of Ramadan and, and maybe in that spirit, I wanna say thank you again for taking the time uh, and for your attention. Um, thank, and thank you. Thank you very thank much you. from the National Library of Israel. Thank you very much, Sam. Except of uh, those questions, we have a lot of um, uh, great comments about the lecture itself. Uh, most of the people said it's really wonderful and uh, Fascinating. So thank you again. Thank you, Sam. And good night to all of you. Good afternoon for those who are somewhere else. And have a great day and evening. Thank you, Sam.